Hello and everyone and welcome. Happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to this month's webinar on fundraising action or handling objections and getting to a yes. Uh, my name is Mohi Kwaja and I'm a trainer for the Fundraising Academy. I'm also the co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation and I will serve as your moderator today. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of notes. Uh, this webinar will be conversational uh, with the opportunity to ask questions during and as well in a 30 minute Q&A following the presentation. Uh, in the Zoom controls, you can use the Q&A option and that way we can make sure we answer your question live. Um, please add any comments or tech support questions into the chat and the Fundraising Academy will be sure to help you. Uh, closed captioning is available for this webinar. Uh, to enable the setting, click on the CC option in your Zoom controls, and the caption size can be adjusted in the video settings under accessibility. Um, in the days following the webinar, the webinar recording and slide deck will be made accessible via our online learning portal. And you will receive an email with a link to register for a free portal so you can access the slide deck and recording at your leisure. So the Fundraising Academy provides education and training to fundraisers through the United States and beyond. Uh, through online and in-person workshops, the Fundraising Academy trains emerging fundraisers to deepen relationships with donors through a cause selling approach. So now I am pleased to introduce today's presenter, Anna Berger. And with more than 20 years of experience in the philanthropic sector, Anna provides coaching and consulting that is steeped in lived experience and as a professional fundraiser, nonprofit executive, campaign consultant, and board member. Her boutique firm, The Philanthropy Coach, LLC, provides strategic development, consult, campaign consulting, um, provides strategic development advising, special campaign consulting, development training, board retreat facilitation, and empowered fundraising coaching. Prior to diving full-time into entrepreneurship, Hannah served as the chief development officer for A Place Called Home in South Central Los Angeles. She was also the national director of development for the Foundation for Prater Willie Research, director of development for the New Children's Museum in San Diego, and senior manager for the Herbalife Nutrition Foundation. Uh, an expert at revitalizing fundraising programs to realize exponential growth, Hana is skilled at building authentic relationships with clients, donors, medias, and community members alike, and thoroughly enjoys coaching other mission-driven professionals to do the same. Using a no-nonsense, heart-centered approach, Hana provide, finds joy in coaching nonprofit executives and board members to turn their passion for community, connection, justice, into and justice into strategic goal setting and effective daily action. Hannah has been involved with Fundraising Academy since 2017 and has been our featured instructor in classrooms and conference halls in South San Francisco Bay Area, San Diego, San Antonio, Cleveland, New York City, and Washington, DC. She's also led several of our Fundraising Academy online cost selling accelerate cohorts. Hannah holds a master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in nonprofit sector management from California State University, Northridge, and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Irvine. And as of last week, she is officially a CFRE. So you guys are in fantastic hands and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Muhi. Um, I kind of want to back up and read your bio to everyone since mine was such a mouthful and you did that so beautifully. <laughs> Not at all. We don't have to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, what I will say about my colleague Muhi is that uh, he is also here with decades of lived experience in fundraising and re relationship development. He is our newest instructor to Fundraising Academy. Um, but he is fantastic. We were together at uh, AFP Icon in Vegas like just last month. <clears throat> and he was in Marvel's Center. Yeah. What's that? I said you bailed me out in Vegas. And he almost had to bail me out today, but we'll maybe tell that story <laughs> later if we have time. We were having some tech difficulties, but here we are. Yeah. Um, I'm so thrilled to see so many of you here online. 
Muhi is going to help moderate, which means he'll be checking out the chat, maybe responding to some of your questions in real time. He'll also interrupt me when I'm speaking too fast or when we need to back up and get some clarity on uh, one of the topics I've just covered. This is intended to be conversational. So please, please, please put those questions into the chat as they come to you. If it's something that you want to make sure we have a little bit more time to really dig into in the Q&A section, you can use the Q&A function. Um, and that will send that question to the queue so that we make sure we respond to it um, in the last sort of 30 minutes of our time together. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So today we're here to talk about overcoming objections and getting to yes. Uh, as Muhi shared in my introduction, I've been an instructor with Fundraising Academy for several years. Um, and in our cause selling certificate cohort, our accelerate classes, this is one of my favorite days to teach um, because it kind of doubles as group therapy, right? Typically when we're either together in person or in our um, code of silence Zoom room with the cohort, we use this as a time to talk about the worst objections we've encountered thus far in our careers and how we either did overcome them or the awkwardness of not being able to and what we wanna do next time we encounter it, right? Um, so I promise you that Muhi and I will share some of our personal stories, um, maybe even a few hard what not to do, you know, learn by my mistakes, not my example, um, but our objectives today um, and my intention for our time together is to help you cultivate a really positive attitude towards objections because you will encounter them, right? This is a part of the work we do as fundraising professionals, as nonprofit leaders. Um, we're gonna talk about, you know, all of the reasons why objections happen and build a better understanding around that so that we're better able to figure out how to respond, right? We'll learn how to leverage objections to uncover hidden questions and concerns that your donors might have but aren't comfortable just saying outright or directly. And then I'll share some basic strategies for overcoming those objections so that we feel better prepared to get supporters on board and raise more for our missions. So I'd love to start with just a really quick poll. I wanna hear from you. Um, I wanna know who's in the Zoom room today. So how many years of frontline fundraising experience do you have personally? That poll should pop up for you in just a second. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and what I mean by, oh, it says individual giving experience, but what I don't know is frontline fundraising. So what I mean by that is, Direct interaction, asking for gifts. That can be in writing. It can be, you know, over the phone. It can be across the table from your donor. But actually soliciting gifts. How many years of frontline fundraising experience do we have? Give you just a few seconds to respond to that. Mohi, how many years do you declare at this point? Yeah, uh, 13 since graduating college, I jumped right into uh, being an associate development officer at a small nonprofit, uh, and that was back in 2009. So I got my feet wet at the University of Michigan. Uh, they had what was called a development summer internship program, and I was so thankful for that because I was a mechanical engineering student three and a half years in. I changed my major uh, and then landed that internship a few years later, so it really set the course for my career. Amazing. I'm so glad I asked. That's a great story. And how smart are they to have that internship in place? Yeah. Okay. So let's see those poll results. Perfect. Okay. So we've got some newbies in the room. That's great. And then a bunch of really seasoned folks. So as we move along through this, again, ask those questions in the chat. But if you've also got some really good insights, go ahead and share that out or put in the Q&A so that you ha perhaps have an opportunity to share a little bit more later. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so in Fundraising Academy, we talk about cause selling, right? That is that is um, sort of our brand of fundraising education. So you will see this a lot. This is the cause selling cycle. It is a three phase, eight step process. Um, and we use it to kind of set the framework for everything that we do around fundraising education and all of the phases and steps we want to take our prospective donors through to build a really healthy relationship that isn't transactional, but is actually setting a foundation for long-term investment, long-term engagement, and a relationship that is good for the community, the organization, and the individuals involved. Okay. So today we're going to focus on step six, 
handling objections. So keep in mind, looking at this cycle, that means that in the cost selling cycle, we have already gone through prospecting and qualification, right? Um, the pre-approach, researching our donor before we introduce ourselves, the actual approach. So that initial engagement, introducing ourselves, sitting down, getting to know them, starting the cultivation of the relationship. Need discovery, which is interviewing our way into exactly what type of uh, engagement or gift or investment of time, talent, and treasure we're going to ask for. The presentation, so that's the more formal piece of the puzzle. We gather all the information, we've developed enough confidence in the relationship that we've started to build that we know what type of gift we wanna move the prospect towards. We present to them our case. And then handling objections is when we presented the case to them and they're coming back to us with feedback, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about today is step six. So share in the chat. Let's, let's get the chat fired up. What does objection mean to you? Oh, I'm just saying we've got a lot of UM folks in the room. That's great. Okay, what does objection mean to you? When you hear that, what do you think of? How does it feel? Sometimes I get nervous if I if I hear the donor pause or you know say something that I wasn't expecting. So it's all about like in the moment how you take that in and how you present it back to them. Great, great. So let's see what we have in the chat here. Yeah, lots of oh, great messages go. in the chat. Some are calling it useful information. Some are saying it's not right now. Um, a reason not to give, a potential maybe. Um, some are saying it's a no. Others are saying it's a concern that needs to be addressed, um, that it's discomfort or a feeling of opposition. All of these are definitely true. Yeah, great responses. Thank you for that. So I wanna give you sort of my perspective on objection. Um, first and foremost, an objection is vastly different from a rejection, right? And in this segment, we're gonna learn all about how objections are often a sign of interest, right? I always like to say, if the prospect is taking enough of their, or taking any of their time and energy, really imposing objections to you for discussion, for, um, you know, they're actually taking an investment instead of just saying, nope, it's a hard stop, it's not for me. They're saying, well, what about X, Y, and Z? If there's an objection in place, that means that they're actually really interested and they're just trying to clarify things in their own mind, right? So in a moment, we'll discuss how to identify the various types of objections that you will encounter. And then of course, talk about the ways to overcome them. So really what we wanna do here today is start to view objections with a different kind of attitude, right? We almost want to start seeking them out um, because they can become really valuable uh, in our donor cultivation and in our solicitation strategies, and they will help guide us towards success with the right perspective. So one more time in the chat, how does it feel when you encounter an objection from a donor? So let's say the last time you sat down with one of your prospects, or perhaps you had them in the Zoom room, and you asked for a gift and they, you were met with a question, perhaps some hesitation. Oh, Carol says it feels like an opportunity. Brittany agrees, a learning opportunity, great. Uh, let's see, Jarek, a rejection, discouraging, but also a learning opportunity may be a challenge. Energized, I love that one. Oh, Catherine, I guess I wish we could ask more. Energized, I like it. Catherine likes a little bit of a challenge. Okay, Jennifer says, want to go back to the drawing board. Okay, we'll dig into that a little bit. Anyone else? How does how does an objection feel? Discouraging yet a learning opportunity, says Gemma. Renee says, hi, Renee. Renee says, okay, now they're coming in fast. It gave me the opportunity to ask why or how I can change your mind. That's fantastic. Okay. Sometimes it might make you feel like you missed something that's important to the donor. It's a great one, Darwin. Um, that you've got more work ahead of you, need to continue finding ways to align priorities. Great one, Summer. Um, 
Rebecca shares, I don't take their note personally. That's really important. Um, I try to find a way to reach them in another way. It may just be not today. Uh, it may just be a no today and then maybe or yes tomorrow. That's a great way to perspective to have. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I'll give you a moment of truth. What I'm going to talk about today around the attitude shift is something that did not come easily to me. Okay. I was probably, I don't know, seven to 10 years into my frontline fundraising part of my career when it stopped hurting my feelings when people started posing objections and I saw it as an opportunity. So if you're one of those folks that feels rejected or is disappointed or feels like it means you didn't knock that presentation out of the park, I want you to try to give yourself some grace and know that this is a process, right? But what we do want to reach for here is a real attitude shift, right? An objection is not a battle to be won. It is a strong indication of interest, right? So, you know, if it was obvious to every donor why they should give to your cause and they just, you know, understood everything that they received from you so freely and could um, integrate it into their own perspectives and their own priorities and without hesitation, they would just hand over money, there would literally be no need for the work that we do as fundraisers, right? So as we move into a discussion of how to handle objections, um, let's redefine them as a positive occurrence and something that helps guide our relationship management. Okay, so as we redefine objections, um, I want you to remember if our prospects have been properly qualified. So when we talk about qualification, for those of you that are newbies, that is when we have identified prospective donors and then we've done our due diligence with research. We've done our Google searches. If we've got access to wealth screening um, software, we have used that. We have talked to people that know our prospects to get insights from them. We've looked at giving history to see if they've already invested in our organization or looked at other organizations and your reports that have similar missions or shared geography. Um, to see if they've given there, right? So we've compiled as much information as we can about this prospective donor to move them forward in our process. We've identified them as a good return on our time invested, right? So they've been qualified. And if they've been properly qualified, an objection is actually a sign that they're in the process of eliminating any remaining personal concerns and moving closer to saying yes to the gift you're asking for. So in fact, an objection can later become leverage for asking for the gift. And we'll talk about that as we move through a few examples when we get to the actual tactics and how to overcome these objections. So, um, you know, somebody said earlier in the chat that an objection feels like I haven't done my work or perhaps there's something I need to revisit or even start over. Donors do object when you haven't answered all of their questions, right? It doesn't mean you have to go back to the drawing board but it does mean, and I think Renee might've said this in the chat, it's a great time to ask why, right? To dig into what it is that they're questioning and how you can better clarify things for them in their own mind, okay? Yeah. And then and we'll talk, of, yeah, go ahead, Mui. Sorry, I was just gonna share, a lot of the times it's, you know, not necessarily having all the information at their fingertips. Maybe there's somebody who needs a story of impact. Maybe it's somebody who needs like hardcore data before they make a commitment. Um, so it's really exploring what type of information you present to uh, your prospect and your donor and how they are responsive to that. Right. That's great. Thank you for that. And, you know, what else comes to mind is sometimes objections aren't even about the content that you've shared. Sometimes it's about questions in their mind about how they can um, sort of the parameters for the gift. Right. So maybe they're thinking through, they're asking me for $50,000, but I can really only afford to give them 20 this year. Right. So it could be a question of, can this be a multi-year investment or do they take gifts of stock? Right. Are there other ways that I can help meet the need and still take care of my personal priorities outside of my philanthropic pursuits? Right. Um, so objections become much easier to manage if you view them as prospective donors asking you to help them figure out how to make their gifts, right? What they need in order to decide, yes, absolutely, but then how to also structure the gift. So for example, you know, if the potential owner says, I'd love to give, but we're sending two kids to college this year, we just don't have the extra money. You could just, you know, say, thank you very much for your time. I'll see you in four years or six if your kid's going to grad school. 
Um, or you could use that as an opportunity to brainstorm with the donor, the prospective donor, about ways to make the gift possible, right? Um, so you move yourself away from being just someone asking for money, um, or hopefully a really friendly person that they trust asking for money to an actual philanthropic advisor, right? You're now a partner in this process. So let's get into the types um, of objections I also want you to sort of keep in mind. There's a few key reasons for why donors object that you're going to encounter. Typically it's because they don't have all the information they want, um, but most objections can be lumped into these four categories. The first being, they don't like your cause or they're objecting to something that's going on with the organization. Hopefully at this point, when you've gotten a presentation, you know that they like your cause, right? Um, but perhaps they're saying, you know, they believe that there's something going on behind the scenes within the operations of the organization that they don't agree with, or they have concerns about how effectively the organization is being run or the specific program that perhaps you're looking for support for. Um, you know, organizations that perhaps come up with, you know, against an audit, uh, the wrong kind, right, um, where something is wrong, that can create an issue, right, out in the general public. If there's been sort of any kind of drama in the past, if you will. So I'll share an example from my career. Um, my One of my first director of development positions was with an organization that had had a sort of a mass exodus of leadership and a complete, you know, um, reorg really with the new executive director. I was the new DOD. There was a new chief finance officer um, and it shook up a lot of the longtime donors, right? So when I was going in to build these relationships with people who had been giving previously and gave in very significant ways to major campaigns, I was needing to overcome objections around well, you're really in a stable place now, right? There's been a lot of change. I don't know all the leadership anymore. Um, you know, that change happened for a reason. Something was terribly wrong at one point. So I need you to help me convince myself and understand that you're now in a, the organization's in a healthier place, right? Um, sometimes folks will tell you they don't like your cause or that the cause is not a priority for them. Um, many of us who are wholehearted philanthropists are very passionate about many things. I love when I'm just getting to know a donor. So in that sort of needs discovery phase of the cause selling cycle, asking them, you know, where in your philanthropic priorities does our mission lie? Would you say we're in your top 10, your top three? Are we your top priority, right? Because that's going to help you shape your future asks. Uh, it's also going to help you kind of figure out how you can get that prospective donor perhaps even more engaged and move your organization and mission sort of up their priority list. Um, some donors will say, you know, the issue with your cause or organization is that your organization isn't very well known um, and they need that sort of social proof or third party validation to help them make their decisions. And uh, the other one I've run into a lot is, you know, organizations with similar missions in similar geographic locations, um, that can be a challenge too around the cause, right? So the next category, um, they may have an objection to the fundraiser, and this is typically hidden. This one can be tough to uncover. The more obvious times you'll encounter this is when you present to your donor or prospect, excuse me, and their body language shifts, right? Indicating that something is wrong. You might wanna ask yourself, did I prepare correctly? Um, am I listening to them actively and responding to their concerns that I'm hearing? Um, some folks who have a more aggressive or direct sort of presentation or pitching style, this can be one of those moments where the prospect starts to object to the fundraiser. And sometimes, and we've talked about this in probably all of the cause selling cohorts, you can encounter prospective donors who haven't uh, encountered a fundraiser exactly like your beautiful, unique self. And there may be a little bit of discomfort there, right? That could be um, any sort of differences that you have with them. Ethnicity, age, religious views, political views that might come up in conversation, right? These are all things that could potentially be one of those objections to the fundraiser. So the third one is an aversion to decision-making altogether, 
this one can be really tricky. This typically presents itself as a stall. Um, so you make your presentation and they say, you know what, stop by next time you're in the area and we'll talk about this some more, right? They're just trying to kind of put it off. Uh, the most common one I come across is I really need to talk uh, about this with my spouse, partner, business partner, philanthropic advisor, some other, other consultant before they can make the decision. And we will talk about how to overcome that. And then the final one is an objection to the gift parameters, right? So this could be the actual amount of the gift that you're asking for, the timing. Um, you know, perhaps that's something that needs to be sort of considered and fully fleshed out. But at the bottom line here, and somebody said this earlier in the chat, thank you so much. These are not personal objections for the most part, right? Even the one that's about, I don't like the fundraiser, that's really not about you. That is about the prospect's perceptions of you or their own, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're not at mind reading yet. Yeah, um, maybe their are Notions, misunderstandings. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom the, the bottom line that I want you all to consider is that objections contain both logic and emotion. But in my experience and in my belief in philanthropy in general, logic frequently takes a backseat to emotion, right? This type of work is really about what we want to do for our community, how we want to change other people's lives, improve other people's lives, legacies we want to leave behind. And so it's great to come to this, you know, any sort of prospect engagement with that in the front of your mind, right? That this is about emotion. It's not always going to make sense. And the best thing I can do is be a really open, active listener um, and consider myself a partner with my prospect. Okay. Muhi, anything in the chat we wanna address before we go right into describing the types of objections? Um, there, nope, but just another reminder, if there are questions, use the Q&A function and we will get to it. Great. Okay, so let's talk about the four types of objections. And we've created these sort of definitions so that we're able to identify them the next time we're in a, a prospect meeting and then identify the best possible response to overcome, right? So let's start with a staller put off. That's when, you know, donors sort of give an excuse, if you will, um, to buy themselves more time, right? Their words typically aren't a full representation of their real feelings or the underlying reasons for the hesitation. So your job is to look for the genuine meaning behind their words. Um, sometimes they're simply trying to avoid making a decision altogether, right? But Frequently, it's because um, there are questions still to be answered. There's something going on with them um, that we need to uncover, right? A stall is likely to kind of rob you of a little bit of that confidence that you walked into the meeting with. In my experience, it definitely kind of hurts the momentum of a conversation and a gift negotiation. But it's remember again, it's an opportunity to build rapport, right? And to leverage the relationship and the um, need discovery that you've already done to really make sure that your prospect sees you as a partner. So again, the example I gave earlier, the stall, I really need to discuss this with my wife, husband, sister, financial advisor, whomever else is a decision maker about their philanthropic giving and get back to you, right? So it's a really key one. Um, if you hear a stall, you're going to want to ask a relevant question and really listen to their response and then repeat it back to them, make sure you've got a full understanding, right? So you're more likely to gain a supporter if you ask questions, uncover their concerns and focus on the relationship rather than closing the gift right in that moment, okay? The searcher. So this is a hidden request for more information. Again, prospects not being completely direct, right? There's going to be times uh, when our prospects object to simply to get more information out of you, even though they've already made a decision, okay? Um, some donors just really want to be 100% sure, absolutely convinced that making this investment is the right thing to do. 
So I find this to be really common with philanthropists who um, are new to major gifts, right? Uh, perhaps it feels like a really big step for them and they know they wanna give, but they just need that reassurance. Muhi, do you have an example? Maybe from your time with the American Muslim Community Foundation or any previous employers that you could share around hidden object or the searcher? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think for for most people who get into these objections, like on the searcher, um, sometimes they just needed more information. Um, and a lot of the times at AMCF, I'm helping them choose different causes that they actually want to give to, right? We, we host donor advice funds. Um, and when they have a a charity in mind, but they don't have the confidence in that charity, they actually ask me to help as a philanthropic advisor. Um, so a lot of the times I'm getting more information on what types of programs these charities have, the uh, efficacy of them, um, what some of their results have been, what other philanthropists have given to, or similar charities that they've given to. Um, so sometimes it's not necessarily about um, that charity itself, but it's just about like, what are other people who want to make uh, impact about this field of education or this field of food insecurity? What are other causes that people are giving to in our local neighborhoods? So a lot of the times, you know, they want to do something, they just don't know how to and they need that additional information to get them more confident before they make that gift. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Muhi. Yeah, so the searcher, again, they're not being direct, but they're looking for answers and it's your job to identify exactly which answers you need to find for them, right? Again, as their part. Yeah, so and, and sometimes the, the donors just wanna be convinced. Like, you know, they're ready to make part with the, the funds that they're gonna commit, but they just need that extra assurance. And I think that's what that one's about too. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So the hidden objection, the difference here is that your prospect really doesn't want you to know what the actual objection is, okay? And this one can be really difficult to identify and overcome because of that sort of element of secrecy or privacy. Um, so these are unspoken hesitations, which, Sometimes you're not always able to completely uncover and they can really delay or prevent a gift. So let me give you an example and then we'll dig a little further. Um, I frequently work with um, different nonprofit community-based organizations on major expansion campaigns. Uh, I was working with one in particular around a $10 million um, scholarship campaign and through the feasibility study, we had identified a lead donor who had identified uh, themselves as willing to make a $3 million gift. Amazing, right? So I get that information. I asked if I can actually share it because feasibility study interviews are typically anonymous. They said yes. Um, we had multiple meetings with the leadership of the organization and this prospective donor. They asked a ton of questions. They brought in the other person who would, in theory, be helping to make this philanthropic decision. You know, we went through budgets. We talked about recognition opportunities, the whole process. And then they said, the timing just isn't right. I cannot do this right now. And we were dumbfounded, right? We had done everything we were supposed to do. Well, fast forward six months. We find out then that this person and their spouse were divorcing, right? So all of a sudden, you know, their family, their finances, everything is in question and up in the air. At the end of the day, the gift did end up happening. It just took significantly longer than originally planned. Um, but looking back on it, what I see as the positive and the learning experience from that was that this prospective donor had built such trust with the leadership at this organization that when it was appropriate to share that very personal information, it was one of the first calls they made, right? Because they wanted 
the CEO, the head of development to know I'm still in this with you. It still really matters to me, but this is what's been going on. And I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you sooner, right? So again, really getting to know your prospects, building trust, seeing this as a long-term relationship, um, I know we're all working with an incredible sense of urgency, but when we're talking about our visions for the future, you know, um, what the end game sort of looks like, the huge steps forward, those things are going to take time and that's okay, right? Um, so that's that's my best possible example of a hidden objection. Um, but again, you know, when this comes up and you just can't, you feel like you're asking the right questions, you're listening intently, you're clarifying what you're hearing from the prospect, and you're still getting a stall, a put off. Um, they're just not being completely forthright with you. That means the, the, pro the prospective donor likely has other reasons that you're not going to be able to uncover right now, right? So the best course of action for dealing with a hidden objection is to treat it like a searcher, right? You're gonna wanna keep asking questions. Um, again, clarifying what you're hearing from them, restating it to make sure you understand where they're coming from. Asking things like, have I answered all of your questions? Is there anything else you need from me right now to help you move forward with making a decision? Okay. And then that brings us to the stopper. So the stopper is an objection to which no satisfactory solution can be found. Not every single prospect, even the ones that we think are perfect candidates, completely qualified, um, will come through with a gift. That's just fact, right? Um, it's, inevitable, it's inevitable that we encounter the stopper at some point or regularly in our fundraising careers. And this is where my philosophy around no means not now comes into play, right? So if you've done everything you can with a qualified prospect and they still say, I'm sorry, it's a no, then, you know, you want to think about, okay, when can I re-engage them? What would be the best time to circle back to you and have this conversation again or share with them a new opportunity to give, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about the techniques that we kind of breezed over um, in negotiating around these objections. So, you know, after you've identified which one of those four types of objections you're encountering, you're in a really good position to respond, right? Um, there's a lot of different methods you can use, but we're going to talk about a few of them that, you know, I feel are the most common um, or perhaps the best practices. So feel felt found. Say that five times fast. Uh, this technique has been around for a really long time. It's actually used in for-profit sales quite a bit. It's a proven way to overcome a stall um, or a really personal concern or... Um, if somebody's objection, objecting to the organization, right, operations, things like that, um, it can offset sort of one of those really uncomfortable kind of aggressive or slightly hostile responses um, that may come up during a presentation. Uh, you know, it can um, be a really good way to inform someone who doesn't yet clearly understand the value that your organization is presenting around whatever initiative that you're asking for investment on. So here's an example of Phil Felt now. Let's say um, you are presenting a prospective donor with an opportunity to invest, make a major gift to um, a mental health program at your organization. And they look at the budget and say, whoa, that is a lot of money to be spending on staff, staff salaries, excuse me. <laughs> Here's how you would use feel felt found. I can understand how you feel about our significant increase in spending on staff salaries. I've had other donors who felt the same way until they found that our counselors are credentialed, they're required to have master's degrees and 10 plus years of direct service experience. They are the best possible candidates to be working with our stakeholders and that the type of professionals that you would want to be engaging with you, your spouse, your children, et cetera, right? You see how that works? Feel felt found. Um, again, it's been around for a really long time. So if you're talking to someone who has a really strong corporate sales background, they will recognize the use of those terms. So you can switch it up, right? I can understand, um, 
you know, your concerns around this. Many people have told me they shared similar concerns uh, until they learned that, blah, blah, blah. See how that works? So um, the next one is compensate or counterbalance. Um, this method is good for um, time, you know, there will be times when donors may give despite certain valid objections. So perhaps things that aren't perfect right now and that maybe you're asking for investments for to improve, right? So if a donor has an objection that is truthful, um, it's really important that we accept and admit any truth in their objection. I hear you, I share your concern. Let me tell you how we're addressing that, right? Um, admitting that there's something that you're not doing perfectly, that your organization perhaps has a disadvantage around at the moment that the donor noticed right? It's important to validate that and then immediately point out how their objection um, is being addressed or is overshadowed by other specific benefits or your plans for the immediate future, okay? So this is a really great way to actually leverage their concern into encouraging them to make a donation. Uh, your job is to convince your prospects that the benefits provide enough value to outweigh their concern, right? Or the disadvantage that exists at the moment. So um, a good way to ac accomplish this is to provide documentation, statistical evidence or third party endorsements that show how a perceived negative may actually be turning into a positive. Or, um, you know, it, it always reminds me of, we don't talk about weaknesses or faults. We use language like opportunity, right? It might not be perfect. It's an opportunity for improvement. So asking why a couple people said in the chat, this is where they go to when they encounter an objection. It is absolutely my first stop on my techniques for negotiating objections. Um, you know, that can be a really great way to kind of just hit the brakes for a second and give them a moment to kind of unload or unpack the objection that they've raised. Right. So just saying, why? Or what is that that you don't like about X? Or um, I hear that you have concerns about this. Can you say more about it? Those are all versions of why, right? Yeah. And really what I've seen when I've asked about this a little bit further is that oftentimes it's a misconception um, and just a misunderstanding or of a past experience that may be folklore now. <laughs> so a lot of the times there are new reasons or new information that they may not have and that's been holding them back. Perfect. Well said, Mohi. Um, the next technique is denying the objection, right? So similarly to what Mohi just shared, um, if there is something that is raised, that is incorrect. It's false information that the donor has. It is absolutely totally appropriate and really your responsibility to deny that objection and correct the misinformation, right? So letting the prospect know that what they're saying is not accurate um, is not only useful in moving the conversation and the relationship forward, but also in protecting the organization's reputation in the community, right? You want to make sure that people are walking around talking about your organization with the, the facts um, in place. So oftentimes when prospects learn things about the organizations from someone or something they read on the internet that's simply not true, um, you pointing out this information as inaccurate, correcting it, denying the objection, giving them truthful information, after, of course, listening attentively to what they have to say um, is really powerful, right? As long as you're responding to them with a sense of dignity and grace, right? We always want to, especially in a situation where it's something really wild, you know, um, gosh, my least favorite example of this. Um, so I worked for several years with a place called Home. Prior to being the chief development officer, I was a volunteer, I was a consultant, uh, I became staff. So I've been engaged with that organization forever. 
uh, feels like forever. I love it. I have encountered people who have lived in Los Angeles for decades and never stepped foot in South Central Los Angeles. And they have these wild misconceptions about what South LA is. And so I could take the approach of like, as a native Angelino, how dare you be judgmental about this very large swath of land, this very large part of Los Angeles culture and all of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that live in the area, right? Or I could say, you know, I hear what you're saying and I'm, I'm sorry, but um, I feel the need to correct some of this information because it's simply not accurate. Can I share some more information with you about this, right? Do you see how that's kind of saying you're wrong? And I'd like to help inform you so that you are best equipped to make a decision, right? Um, so your attitude is really critical when using this technique. Your goal is, of course, to earn the prospect's respect, avoid a, an adverse reaction or anything that feels confrontational. Um, but you want to make sure your prospects know what the full truth is. And it's important that you stand up for your organization's values and your stakeholders in the process, right? The next method I wanna, or technique I wanna talk about uh, is the boomerang. So this one allows you to agree with prospects while showing them that their objection need not prevent their commitment. Um, it's a method used in a situation where the prospect's area of objection is actually a point in favor of becoming a supporter. So um, think about a boomerang, right? Throw it out, it comes back around. So here's another example from my time at a place called home. When COVID, now remember, this is a youth development center called a place called home. When COVID shut down the physical campus in March of 2020, we moved all of the education and support programs, counseling and enrichment classes online within a matter of three weeks, very fast. Um, and so I was immediately talking to major donors about, you know, doubling down on their commitment, making sure they came to the table. At that point, we were all, I'm going to speak for all of us in the Zoom room right now, pretty terrified about what might happen to the sector, right? We knew that our services were going to be needed. Many of our organizations were expanding services to respond to really urgent, critical needs at a place called home. One of those things was food insecurity, right? We became a place to actually give food to families um, in addition to everything else we were already doing. So I'm making calls and, you know, some of the donors were like, why do you want to talk about donations right now? You guys are shut down. Everybody's at home. Nobody's at the place. And my response, and this is the boomerang response, was why am I requesting a meeting now while things are so uncertain and we're all stuck at home? because our incredible team has already figured out how to move our programs online. In fact, we're discussing operating, we're discussing opening our very long waiting list so that kids who haven't been able to access a place called homes, life-changing programs now can from the safety of their homes, but we need more support to make that happen. So do you see how I took their concern, responded to it and made them understand that that was actually exactly the point of, of the ask of the conversation. Okay, so you bring it back around. Curiosity, so this is really asking why on a deeper level, right? Um, we wanna make sure that we are being really straightforward, right? It's not sort of tiptoeing around the concern, but um, you know, let's say the donor says, you know, I just don't think that what you're asking for really fits into my philanthropic goals for the year. Curiosity would be, really? Well, I'd love to hear more about what your goals are. Would you mind sharing them with me? Right? Kind of an open-ended question just to get them to really unpack for you what's happening. Okay. Um, and then answering with visuals, right? Mookie talked about this earlier. Some folks are really data-driven. Some of us are visual learners. Um, for those of us who have really complex organizations or missions, visuals can be really important to overcoming objections, right? Um, we live and breathe this work every day, right? Our organization's mission, even the most committed 
donor, volunteer, board member, typically speaking, they don't know everything that you know as a staff member, right? Because you're in it every single day. So I always like to check myself when I was making presentations and soliciting gifts. I wanted to make sure I had some visual elements on hand, especially when doing this by Zoom. Things that you can pop up onto the screen when the digital eye contact gets awkward, right? <laughs> things that help people sort of um, structure their thoughts, things to come back to. That can be charts, it can be a video, uh, it can be images of your stakeholders, um, just different sorts of elements that can help with the learning process, right? So you don't want your presentation to become a lecture or feel really one-sided. You want it to be a conversation, right? And visuals can really help with that. So most of us know that timing is everything as I check the time to see where we are. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about when to answer objections and then we will get into our Q and A. So if you have burning questions for me or Mookie, um, please make sure you drop them in the Q and A or the chat so that we can come back to them. So when to answer objections, timing is super important in any negotiation, right? Um, Prospects will introduce an objection at a time that favors their position, not yours. So you should make sure that you are choosing to respond in a time that's gonna help you get closer to a yes, right? So four logical times for responding to a donor's concerns, anticipating it and forestalling. So that means that if in the needs discovery, certain things popped up for you as potential red flags, for what you are currently seeking support of, you're going to wanna to anticipate that and already present responses to those potential objections in your presentation. It's almost like you're reading their mind, right? So a really well thought out presentation delivered from the prospect's point of view, um, that's going to help you anticipate and forestall things that they might have concerns around, okay? And don't just give really short responses um, to potential roadblocks, really spell it out. Connect the docs for your donors. When we're giving presentations, I like to remind people that, you know, unless you're being condescending in tone or body language, you can't really be remedial enough. It's always good to go back to the basics to make sure that you are, you know, you and your prospects are starting from the same place, right? Um, if an objection is raised during your presentation, you likely will want to try to answer it immediately and get it out of the way to keep yourself on track, right? Um, you know, most valid objections should be answered when they're raised, unless you have a logical reason to wait. Um, I'll give a couple examples in a second. But that said, make sure you don't feel rushed to respond to an objection that you know is a real concern um, if you don't have the answer. It's always appropriate to say, that's a really great question. I don't have those details with me today, but I'm gonna write it down and make sure that I circle back to you with that information. That's a really great question, thank you, right? Or um, you can postpone the answer until later on in your presentation, right? By saying something to the effect of, Great question, I'm so glad you asked. That's actually at the end of this presentation or great question. What I'd like to do is table it for the end so that um, I can walk you through the rest of this information and see if you know it helps clarify things for you or if another question arises, something like that, okay? The postpone, the answer, um, that's, you know, that's something that I use when I'm teaching a lot right? Uh, it's my parking lot usually when I'm working with a cohort because questions will come up that are really juicy and it might derail the entire presentation. And typically speaking, we put in a lot of time and energy into crafting these presentations for our prospects. And you want to make sure you hit every point you intend to and um, address their objections, right? We also want to make sure that we don't answer an excuse. So there are some issues um, that won't have a worthwhile answer. 
prospects may raise concerns that have nothing to do with the conversation at hand or say things that have little relevance to the point you're trying to make. This can be awkward, but it does happen. Um, and by acknowledging the excuse, you may actually turn it into a real objection or get yourself off track. And it can just, you know, kind of derail things in general. So if it's an excuse, for instance, in a really awkward meeting once this just came to mind uh, with a board member of a client around a capital campaign and the conversation was around a major gift and this person out of the blue very focused laser focused on me during the presentation and then all of a sudden he said I'm sorry I just cannot focus I haven't eaten anything today are you hungry right? It was a weird excuse. And it felt like he was potentially just trying to derail the conversation or having a very honest moment about how hungry and distracted he was by that. Um, so what do you do with that? I'm not going to go into about how hungry I am. Also, what I'm going to say is, you know what, I just need five more minutes of your time. Um, but let me see if, you know, the assistant out there might have some snacks on hand real quick five seconds out the door, come back in, let's get back to it, right? Just wanna keep things on pace. Muhi, anything to add about answering objections in our timing? No, I think, um, you know, we got, uh, this is my favorite slide right here, so I'd rather you go into it and then we enter into questions. Yeah. This is my favorite too, yeah. So um, I told everyone in the room in Vegas when I presented this session that, I use this six step plan and I'll literally sit with the upside down triangle chart and map myself out of script, right? Um, I like to do worst case scenario planning. I know that some people think that that's a little like morbid and says something about um, me more than, more than anything, but I find that it's really helpful. It helps ease anxiety for me. So I'll use this six step plan and think about what are some really tough objections that I might need to overcome after the, after and or during this presentation? And then I'll walk myself through listening and hearing them out, right? Confirming my understanding. So some crazy potential response. How am I going to um, make sure I'm listening to them? Well, I'm going to keep my body posture open, even if I get really nervous, right? I'm going to nod along to them so that I make sure I'm hearing the points they're making. Um, when they stop talking, I will then confirm my understanding, right? What I'm hearing you say is X, Y, and Z. Acknowledging their point of view, right? Um, thank you for sharing that with me. I really appreciate you bringing up these points. I think they're super important to address today also, right? We're gonna select a specific technique of those that we just covered, um, which feels right in that moment. So, you know, we've acknowledged their point of view. Let's say it's something like what I referenced earlier with an organization that's had a huge leadership shift and the prospect says, you know, your whole team left and I barely know you. And, you know, the folks that I knew on the board are gone now and I'm just, I don't feel like I've been well taken care of. I wasn't hearing from anyone for over a year. You know, um, I want to make sure I acknowledge that point of view and say, you know, on behalf of the organization, I want to apologize. Right. And I want to make sure that moving forward, you feel really well taken care of. So tell me more about, um, you know, how I can make sure that, that that happens for you. What does being well taken care of feel like, right, from your perspective? So you know, that was me getting curious, right? That was the technique that I chose to use in that situation. And then answering the objection. Um, you know, negotiation is not persuasion. It's not manipulation. Um, you don't want to use explanations that make things foggy or cause people to feel like you're pressuring them, right? Um, the answer to any objections, though, need to be thorough, direct, and conclusive. You don't want to over explain something 
that can just really confuse matters for your prospect. Um, you're always going to be honest and factual, right? You never want to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Overpromise things that aren't part of your plan, right? Um, you just wanna make sure you are responding really directly and really succinctly to the objection. Um, body language again here, while you are responding to the objection, really matters, especially if we're in person, right? If we're on Zoom, it's a little bit different, but in person, you wanna make sure your body language stays open. You wanna keep your tone level and measured, um, especially if you're getting a little bit worked up, right? Breathe and, and bring it down. I would say breathe and bring it down. So just remember, when you are responding to the objections, you're answering questions, you're telling them how the information they have is perhaps incorrect. Um, delivering that with an open posture and a warm affect is always better received, right? And then if we are in the best possible space, it feels right, we're gonna attempt to close. This can mean closing the conversation and agreeing on a next step. It can mean attempting to close a gift, right? So of course, we're only going to attempt to close the gift if that was our plan today, right? We've had our presentation, we're ready to make a solicitation and we've been negotiating our way to that. We feel confident in the fact that a yes is likely. Um, so when you've successfully answered a major objection, you've created an opportunity to close, especially if you're near the end of your presentation and the timing feels perfect, right? Attempting a, tr a trial close um, before continuing on can be a really smart move. And what that looks like is, kind of presenting a hypothetical, right? So a trial close might be, if you were to make an investment in this project, do you think you have a gift range in mind? Or in your opinion, do you feel like what I've presented today um, is a program that's worthy of your commitment? Or how are you feeling about the information I've shared thus far, right? Those are all ways to get put it on the prospect to say back to you, like, I'm feeling really good about this. Um, I think the amount of money you're looking for is makes sense. Just gaining some sort of feedback so that you know if it's time to, in fact, ask for the gift. Okay, and then go ahead, Mohi. I was just gonna say, it's a good temperature read, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity for, because really it's all about listening for the cues from the donor. Uh, but I think that question really provides the donor the opportunity to share how ready they are. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, and you know, let's say you attempt the close and you know, worst case scenario, what happens? The person says no, or they offer yet another objection, right? So if that happens, what do we do? We try to identify the reason for the remaining objections that we need to overcome. And we make a plan with them about what information we need to circle back with or the timing to follow up with them. If they've said, you've done a great job of answering all of my questions. I feel really good about what you've presented. I just need to confirm some things with my attorney. Great. Can I give you a call on Tuesday? Right. We always want to make sure that we are leaving our prospects with our next engagement confirmed. Okay. So we're going to go to Q&A just a moment. In quick summary, objections are usually a sign of interest. They are a good thing that we are now going to feel really good about, right? Because our attitude is key to our success. Um, we identified the four categories of, of objections today. Stalls, searchers, hidden objections, and the stoppers. And then we identified, we talked through the six step plan which you will have access to in these slides. And I encourage you to try using it in your own uh, prospect meeting planning. It can be really, really helpful. And with that. Yeah, um, you know, thank you so much. And if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A section in the Zoom control panel. Um, and as people are typing those up, this is just a reminder that the slide deck the recording uh, will all be available in the online learning portal. It takes our marketing team a week or two to kind of put that all together and piecemeal it back to you. Um, so the email access, uh, you will receive an email to access the free portal. It's mylearningportal.org 
Uh, it's an easy way for you to track your CFRE content, uh, to access all the previous webinars and on-demand videos. Uh, so it's a great place to get more information and we're looking forward to having you at our next webinar in July as well. So I'll drop the chat, uh, if it is, I'll drop the link in the chat if it isn't there already. Um, and I see a few questions coming into the chat, uh, which is good, uh, but as well, if we can use the uh, Q&A function, that'll make sure we don't miss anything either. Um, got a great comment from Carol, terrific content and presentation. Thank you. Um, let me see. I'll scroll up and make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, what if a prospective donor replies, your organization isn't part of our cycle of giving this year? This was a year ago after they canceled a Zoom meeting. Um, I accepted the objection and since have only contacted the donor to share news of our organization. Would you continue to reach out? I feel a bit stuck. Yeah, great question. Um, so, I think I might be hearing that this is an institutional donor, which can be certainly different than an individual, but the similarities here are that there are people running institutions and corporations, right? So um, if you haven't done it already, my strongest sort of piece of advice is to identify who your you know, partner in crime is at this place, who the um, sort of ally for your cause may be, and ask them to have a conversation that's more casual. Can I, you know, I'm gonna be in the area next week. I'd love to get coffee with you and hear more about your work, your position. Um, you know, uh, especially if you're new at an organization, it's a great time to really leverage your blissful ignorance or naivete to get meetings with people to ask them questions about what they do and what their priorities are. So, um, a year has gone by. It sounds like you have shared good information with them. If we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I would want to know exactly what does that look like? Does that mean you're sending emails? Does it mean you're sending snail mail? Does it mean you've actually um, had phone calls or Zoom meetings or seen them in person? Um, because all of those things matter, right? The ways we engage folks uh, can be everything. The key is finding out how they want to be engaged. If this is someone who keeps telling you it's just not a fit, believe them and move on, right? We wanna make sure that we are patient and persistent, but also spending our precious, precious time with our prospects that are going to have the highest return on our time invested. So that's my best advice for that without having to answer to all those other questions. Mohi, did you wanna share anything else? No, I think what you shared was a great, uh great advice and yeah really it's about you know reaching out not being intrusive um sharing that kind of reminder seeing if they'll take time for a call um seeing what other causes are on their list and maybe even asking what was it that determined um your organization to fall off their giving list so trying to be a little bit more curious with that one i think would be helpful um, just to give you some more clarity and see if there's any way that you can handle that objection a little bit better. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in, so we can get to those. Uh, Jen says, um, for membership orgs, any tips for those who share they no longer attend to give because they can no longer patronage the org themselves? Hmm. No longer intend to give because they. So maybe it's a age based organization or like a youth services organization, or maybe it was something that involved their kids and they've grown out of that. Um, there's not more information to it, but maybe just like something that they, or maybe they moved out of the local area and can't benefit from the membership organization either. Um, yeah. So in those types of scenarios, what would you suggest? Yeah, thank you for that, Mohi. So I'm thinking like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Um, yeah, something geographically specific. 
Uh, I think that the approach there is all about that person's experience and their interest or willingness in paying it forward. What did you, you know, you want to find out from them, what did you get out of being a part of being a member of this? And who do you want to see having those same benefits? Um, how has it changed your life, your career, your community for the better? Um, that's immediately where my mind goes. It's kind of approaching them from a legacy standpoint. This is potentially a great opportunity to ask for advice, right? If they've been a part of the membership organization in the past and they're saying, I'm no longer a member, so I'm not going to keep giving. Okay, you know, I hear you. I completely respect your response. I would love to pick your brain about some plans that we have for our membership base and get your feedback because who knows it better than you? Somebody who's been a part of this organization, right? What's the old adage? If you ask for money, you're likely to get advice. If you ask for advice, you just may get money. So that's the approach I would take there. Muhi, any other thoughts? Brilliant. Um, yeah, and Rebecca shared as part of the feedback, um, you know, they'll reach out again and approach it casually and it was a corporate giver, so. Um, nice. nice. Um, and then Gemma, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, what if a donor wants to give, but is wondering what's the benefit for them? Um, quick thoughts yeah. on that. I would use curiosity um, to get really clear about what kind of benefit they're hoping for, right? Um, and what kind of benefits might your organization be open to? So immediately when I hear benefits, I work a lot on capital campaigns. So I think of naming rights, you know, some sort of public recognition that they've invested in being a part of this community or the space, um, you know, um, other opportunities. If we're talking about corporate donors, here's the bottom line with corporate donors. Everybody ready? They're looking for marketing benefits. It might not be the only reason they want to invest, but it is a major one. So if you are approaching corporations without having at least a short list of the ways that partnering with your cause benefits their marketing and brand in the community, you definitely want to start addressing that, right? So I would use curiosity with this objection, really try to uncover, you know, what their greatest hopes are. This is a negotiation after all. Yeah, and, and part of it has to do, like you mentioned, even with the other example, um, legacy building, what type of impact do they want to make? Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of intrinsic value that is derived from making a charitable gift, uh, but also at the same time, what impact can they make in their lifetime? Uh, so talking to them about what causes their passion about why they like to give um, and seeing uh, what motivates them and what they appreciate about your organization and why they support it. So I think all of those tie together well about what the benefit will be for the donor. Absolutely. It's a great point. And you know, if you're talking to a donor that you know has children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews even, um, positioning that question around benefits and legacy from that perspective, like, what, you know, I'm curious, what would feel really valuable to you in terms of how it would impact your kids? Something like that can really help push uh, the conversation in an emotional direction that can really help get you closer to yes. Okay, um, we've got a few minutes left. Any last questions? Thank you, Gemma. I hope we got your name right. All right. I get a lot of kickbacks as my program is in-kind focus, specifically groups, individuals doing drives. Any suggestions how to overcome an objection to a drive? It's from Rebecca. Any suggestions how to overcome an objection to a drive? Rebecca, the question I would want to ask you is, what are the specific objections you're hearing? Um, because drives tend to be labor, at least psychological labor, right? Networking, 
perhaps planning, um, perhaps, you know, it's actual goods. So collecting and moving things around, um, they can be labor intensive for the donors. We don't work inside the office. We would rather do volunteering. Can you say more, Rebecca? Oh, I'll finish that thought. Um, I'd wanna know what the specific objections are around the drive and how your organization, the staff, the volunteer leadership team can create systems perhaps that um, sort of, you know, um, get ahead of the objections being posed, right? So resources that you're able to provide to your donors to make the process of a drive, the experience of a drive easier and harder to say no to. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Thanks, Rebecca. Darwin asked, how do I overcome le leadership objections to golf tournaments? Leadership does not like golf personally, prefer white tablecloth dinners. Such a good question, Darwin. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. overcome objections. Go ahead, Mohi. You want to take yeah. this one? For this one, just to start, I would say, like, what do your donors want? What What are the donors interested in? Um, and, and go based on that. Uh, leadership, whether they're board members or staff or um, executives, may not have the pulse on the donor community as you do as a director of development or a major gift officer. Um, so I would maybe even be open to polling your donors. Like how do they like to be uh, engaged in supporting your organization? Um, and if you feel like you have a good enough response for a golf tournament, maybe you can take that data back to leadership and say, well, this is actually what the donors would like to do. Um, and then from there, finding a host committee of people who are committed to helping you make sure it's a success. Um, you know, white tablecloth dinners, golf tournaments, all organizations do them all the time. But really, how are you going to make whatever event you do the most unique, the most successful, the most attractive, uh, and the most engaging for your donors? Beautifully said. Yeah. Donors and new community partners have requested capital naming rights. Okay. What's the question there, Darwin? I think more, um, more about what the donors would like to see. They've requested capital naming rights. Does that have to do with the golf fundraising or are we, is this a separate topic? Yes, it has to do with golf. Hmm. So maybe little... sponsorship opportunities and you know naming holes and. I mean, uh, capital naming rights. If we're talking about actual physical spaces, those are generally really significant price tags. Um, so I'm a little confused, but I think, you know, back to Mohi's point about surveying your stakeholders to find out what they want, what excites them. It's hard, let me put this another way. Data-driven decision-making is always best, right? So if you can put strong data in front of your leadership, especially on a topic that you're not in agreement about, it can help move that conversation along, help overcome their objections. So surveying, um, if you're able to, get some statistics from organizations that are of similar size or uh, mission or scope as yours around the success of golf tournaments as of late. <clears throat> that can be really beneficial also, right? Um, especially now in this post-ish current COVID era, um, in-person events are tricky. Um, so doing a little sort of peer or market research to find out what's working for folks um, that's always a smart idea. So Darwin, I'm going to invite you to reach out to me directly if you'd like to 
sort of brainstorm around this further because um, it sounds like I have so many questions. But thank you so much for posing those. Um, so we're just about at time. Here's my contact information. Uh, I encourage you to connect with me online. Oh, sorry, it's Hema. Um, I'm sensitive to that. It's hard in writing, but thank you for the correction because I am Hana, not Hannah. I would say it rhymes with Donna, not banana, unless you're British and then it's a whole other thing. But um, please connect with me online. I'm also trying to be very active on LinkedIn. So I'd love to connect with you there. It's been an absolute pleasure. Again, as Muhi said, please log on to mylearningportal.org and sign up for the Fundraising Academy Learning Portal. You will have free access to this webinar and so many others and other really incredible resources. Uh, Muhi, any last thoughts? Yeah, just thank you everyone for your participation in our Q&A and for your incredible questions today. Uh, again, you'll be receiving a link to access the slide deck and recording and follow up in the next week or so. Um, thank you to our audience for your time and participation. Each of you have such meaningful lives outside of work uh, and within work. And we're just really thankful for you to spend an hour and a half with us today uh, to help us continue to improve our monthly webinar series and ensure that we are providing value to you please take a few minutes to complete our survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Uh, we hope that you all, all are all safe and healthy and please enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you for all that you do to make the world a better place and the communities that we live in much better. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, Muthi, for moderating. Of course. Take care, everyone. <laughs>